It's now my pleasure to welcome our first uh, keynote speaker. It is Matt Ball. And, um, you know, my, my relationship with the, the First Nation people here was when I became homeless and started having what some of you may call psychosis. There was a local homeless mob that lived there who I'd got to know over the year before, and they always said to me, if you ever need anything, then you, you let us know. We'll look after you. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful, and it's a real privilege to come back here and be welcome. I, I want to talk a bit about um, psychosis or psychotic or dissociocotic. And um, you won't have heard of the word dissociocotic most of you because it's a word I made up, and I'm going to explain it later. But it's an important word to me because it's a word that... Uh, has developed in my mind and in my heart and in my relationships of observing other people, both in my experiences of living with the labels of psychosis and also as a professional. And, and it sort of sets up what I want to say today. Much of what I'm going to talk about is going to come down to your perceptions of the people you come into contact with. And that's going to define how you respond to them or not. And currently in the mental health system, we have a, a system and a structure that says that I know more than somebody else, and these are the labels that define somebody else's narrative. And we heard about this yesterday in different forms, and we heard Sebastian call out whether there's any evidence to what we do or don't do, and I hope today we'll follow on to confirm there is no evidence behind the evidence, but also what do we want to do about that as an alternative. And for the professionals in the room, I'm mindful this stuff can be challenging. Some of you are going to hear what I say and you're going to think about times when you've been involved with seclusion or restraint or detaining someone or coercing someone. Or, or, and, and they're things that happen when we all operate in the systems of power and in the labels of power. So we can all move forward together rather than this narrative of one group versus another group. And that's kind of the spirit of... What I want to uh, Ronnie Lang's quote, sanity is determinism and totalitarianism. It is the death to the soul and the end of freedom. And uh, I, I really love this quote because it talks about the idea that we're aiming to take people who we think have a mental disorder and the language and culture around that is madness, illness. And, and what, what R.D. Lang is saying is actually that the structures that maintain this and the determinism that comes with these labels is what we call sanity, but actually it's quite insane. R.D. Lang would have seen, said uh, in his book, In the Divided Self, he talked about, if you, if you say to a psychotic person that their psychotic state isn't real, they think you're psychotic. You know, there's an equity in that. You know, your state isn't real to me. Well, your state's not real to me, you know. But because we've got these structures and labels, then it's very hard for us to move outside of that. And I just want to clarify what we mean by determinism. Determinism is usually understood to preclude free will because it entails that humans cannot other act, otherwise act than what they do. So what, when we give someone a label and we create this narrative and this box for people, it makes it very hard for the rest of us to see how anyone can come out of that box. It also makes it very hard for the person themselves. And totalitarianism is the system and the structure we've got. It's exactly what Sebastian was talking about yesterday. We've got a totalitarian position which says that we need something to justify how we do what we do and so that we can keep moving forward with it. So it's a sort of centralised process. And that's what the disorder labels and all the evidence that we currently have uh, does, is it creates a kind of central structure of which everything else moves out. But, but within that, it means we determine people's future. And, and that's not a great thing when we think about recovery. So, so we, we need to talk about that. And what I'm going to suggest today in the context of this then is that we could think about phenomenology, we could think about the, the experience that the other describes as the starting place for why they are presenting or telling us how they are. So if I'm psychotic, you could ask me why I'm psychotic and we could work from there. If I'm depressed in mood, you could ask me why I feel sad and I could tell you and we could move from there. But when we lay these labels on top, what we actually do is we reduce the potential to hear that narrative, that social construct that's emerged in our lives. And there's no one in here that doesn't have a social construct that at some point in their life has been difficult to make sense of. But the importance of that is that we've all got these stories that we don't want people to know about, right? And those stories are really vital. And in the relationships that we create, we need to allow those stories to emerge. But 23 years ago, I was shipped back to England uh, by the mob that looked after me. They took me to the immigration centre and helped me get home. Spent some time in the detention centre at Perth. And having started hearing voices in the park in Northbridge, I then went to Perth's detention centre and got put in a solitary cell because I wasn't going to be there long enough because I wasn't seeking asylum or anything like that. And um, 
that's when I heard a bunch more voices and, and this idea of suicide and the narrative of suicide really emerged in my adult life. It had been there in my childhood. So I identify as someone who's got a lived experience um, of madness. And on that journey, I think I picked up six diagnostic labels, that sort of categorizations. And some of the favorites, I suppose, were psychotic depression or depression with psychosis. I'm not sure the difference. Um, I got a label of schizophrenia from one uh, psychiatrist, which bugs me till today because I still can't get life assurance based on the label 23 years ago. You know, th this is the determinism that comes with the psychiatric structures in which we operate. And then, of course, there was the wonderful professionals, which many of us are in this room, who chose to write a label and then retract the label when they realised they were wrong. And that's a very simple process that we can do when we're working with people. When we've come across a structure and we've given it a label and then we hear someone's narrative and we realise that we were incorrect, we can alter our narrative in support of the other person's narrative being meaningful and just. Um, anyway, I, I, I also was a child who suffered uh, some, uh, some trauma. We were talking about trauma yesterday. Um, and, um, you know, so that's shaped my journey. Finally ended up in the mental health system. I got put on antipsychotics and mood stabilizers. I experienced some seclusion, or ECT treatment. And, um, you know, as I say, it's not about us sitting in shame, but it is about questioning why we do what we do. Uh, and the only thing I can remember from ECT, because, of course, it's not great for your memory, is, um, is that afterwards I used to have a nurse sit with me and give me jam on toast and a cup of tea. And having had Valium an hour before, this, it was quite a nice experience in a funny sort of way. It was years later that I kind of really started to resent the idea of sticking electricity through my brains. So this is why we need to think about the social determinants and the social narratives and not the labels, because otherwise we're willing to do strange things to people. The reason why it's most important is this is my wife and my three beautiful children and me. And when I was given the label of being treatment-resistant psychotic and put into a house for people who were treatment-resistant and question marks about whether we would ever recover, both on a social level and a physical level, this wasn't possible. <laughs> so it's really important in my narrative that you hear my story rather than see the labels that you give me because otherwise you determine that this wonderful experience of mine can't happen right now. What does that look like in the professional world? Well, we, when, we, when we think about psychosis, we can think about whether we're seeing an illness, a biological state, a kind of disorder, or whether we're seeing the product of someone's environment. And let's name the trauma as the origin of most of this um, for many people. And this, this paper by Pavon and Vase was an absolute gem. It was done with psychologists and social work students. And the main finding from this was the degree to which the healthcare professional engages in dehumanisation depends critically on the professional's conceptualization of schizophrenia, namely biogenetic or psychoenvironmental. And being that we haven't identified and located a biogenetic cause of schizophrenia yet, we need to go to the psychoenvironmental. Um, you know, we, we know now that trauma lies at the origin of many psychotic disorders and unusual states. Um, so, so now we need to go to the psychoenvironmental narrative and not the biogenetic one. Um, what this actually looks like in practice, the dehumanisation in this, was uh, a quicker and more willing to shackle, to detain, to seclude and to inject. So if we see it as a biological disease, those are the things we're quicker to do. If we see it as psychoenvironmental, we're less likely to do those things. Why is that? Well, another paper showed us that, um, from Arne and Leibowitz, told us that um, the ability for professionals to empathise is dependent on whether we see a psychoenvironmental issue or a biogenetic condition. So that's really important and it unpacks this paper because what it's saying is that if I see that this person's environment has been intolerable, oh, I can get into empathy with that. I, I can sit in relationship with the distress that person might be feeling. If I think they've got a disease that I don't know how to control and my society says that's mad and scary, then it's hard for me to know where to begin the relationship. And then if I quote Lang again, because I'm a Lang biased person, um, he said to look and listen to a person and to see signs of schizophrenia as a disease and to look and listen to him simply as a human being, or to see and to hear in a radically different way. So in this process of empathy, not only do we offer somebody else something, but we have a new experience of that person as well. So this is, for me, a real gift, what I'm saying today. It's a challenge and a gift that we can actually move into new spaces. And then I look at the modern era, and I think about what we're doing currently. Where did most of our structures come from? They come from the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Disorders. Some of you will know what that is, some of you won't. It's a book that was made up by some white men in a room in the 60s and some disorders were defined. This is all available to look and read. Um, 
And then we've built on that over the years. And the third edition of this book was intended to um, research the scientific validity of these disorder labels. Um, and what turned out is that there was no scientific validity. But we've continued now to the fifth edition. And, but it's about how do we move into that? And then we can take the research that we've got and say, oh, what do we want to do now that we've defined that the research perhaps isn't even relevant? Well, fortunately, we're moving on to a new model. And the ICD is the World Health Organization's version of the DSM. And we're on the current 10th edition in 2022. The 11th edition will come out. And one of the things they've highlighted is the social codes in the ICD-11. So just to clarify, when someone comes into a mental health system and we code them as having a disorder, we use the ICD-10 at the moment, and in the future we're going to use the ICD-11. And that's how the funding stream works in the government, broadly speaking. We have to have a label and a code. Well, the ICD-11 has got a whole section on social codes, and this is really exciting, right? So any of you that want to change your practice and stand up against the diagnostic frameworks, this is your moment. And, and what they say, these phenomenological codes offer a constructive and radical way forward. And I, I love the use of radical, and I'll explain why in a minute. So what do social codes look like? Well, in the new ICD-11, we can actually start to talk about people's narratives in a sense that makes sense both to the person and allows us to get into empathy and relationship with a human experience. So we might say someone that comes to our system has a personal history of sexual abuse. And, and then it's very much easier to look at a psycho-environmental dilemma and a trauma-informed model and say, gosh, that person suffered sexual abuse. What on earth would, how on earth would that set up your world? Rather than saying, oh, this psychotic person, I don't really know what to do, but they're psychotic and we'll give them a treatment. So that's really important. History of spouse or partner violence. In South Australia, we're, um, it was alarming the amount of women that were given bipolar disorder labels on the exiting or returning to domestic violence situations. But now we can give them a label. Ah, oh, we can give them a label that actually makes sense to the narrative. Low income is, is identified as an issue that might send someone into a space of madness. Well, if we're in poverty and low income and we've got no way out, it's quite easy to notice how we might go a bit mad with that. Um, depressed mood rather than depression, I think that's really important. My children at the moment are exploring their use of emotion labels, and one of them likes to say she's got depression. She's only seven, I ask her... <laughs> It's bloody depressing. I ask her, what is depression? She said, well, it's when I feel sad. Oh, good. <laughs> good. So you've got sadness, not depression. You know. Anyway, but we can say people have got depressed mood if that's the language they want to use. Um, feelings of guilt. I wonder in this room anybody who's ever felt guilt. And yet the disorder labels would have guilt as one of the symptomology. Now we're moving away from that and saying, no, we can just name the phenomenology. This person is coming here with deep senses of guilt and it's really interrupting their relationships with the world, their relationships with others, their relationship with self, very important. And non-suicidal self-injury, Just I included it just because I think it's a very valuable um, discussion we need to have more about, uh, about when people tell us that I burnt myself with a cigarette or I cut my arm. And we can actually go to the narrative rather than go to risk and fear and worry. But we need to see that as a psycho-environmental response rather than part of a disorder if we're going to do that. And then... There's this other bit where it talks about cultural considerations. Um, and I'll just give you the panic disorder idea. The symptom representation of panic attacks may vary across cultures, influenced by cultural attributions about origin or pathophysiology. For example, individuals of Cambodian origin, and this was a group who had been massacred and colonised and brutalised by the Pol Pot regime. Um, they they, they emphasised that panic symptoms attributed to dysregulation of Kyol, a wind-like substance. And if you just take a moment, just take a moment, if anyone here, which is all of you, by the way, has ever experienced the experience of anxiety and what that might feel in your body, it's not very far, even in my white Western body and mind, to think about, yeah, when that's really going on, I could imagine that as a moving thing happening inside me. And so then we have a narrative for it in Cambodian culture. It's wind moving through me. It's very straightforward. And this is where we're going with the model. So radical or not, it's really important because this is where we're going with our new models. So even the DSM task force that we're talking about, cultural representation of mental disorders, even they stated that PTSD does not represent the full spectrum of response to trauma across cultural context. So you've got permission to work differently if you don't agree with the pet mental health system. Dig into it, it's all there. There's nothing new that what I'm saying. Um, and then it said, and, and especially when there's cultural trauma involved. 
So, so we've got the narrative we need to move away from labelling people. For so what is radical? And I, and I wanted to include this because I know I was supposed to give some examples of when we've rolled this out. In South Australian Mental Health Services between 2013 and 18, I facilitated the Hearing Voices approach across the system, trained 200 staff, worked with 300 families, didn't give any of them a label of a psychiatric disorder in that time. Um, and the, the people who were being offered this found it very useful just to have the opportunity to tell a story without a label. Now there's lots of work after that and the constructs that we use in this work are about uh, sort of making meaning, useful ideas. So as an example, maybe the voices I heard when I was younger relate to a person that threatened to kill me. Well, it may or may not be accurate, but it's useful to me because I can work through some of those emotions now. Whereas if we say the voices I heard that got me the label of schizophrenia or a biolog biological disease, well, unfortunately, the four psychotropics they had me on at one time didn't deal with that either. So we may as well go to the story that I can make sense of. But it turns out this is quite radical. Over the five years that I introduced the hearing voices approach to the public system and talked about psychiatric diagnosis labels not being terribly useful, there was allegations that I'd threatened to bomb health centres. There was allegations that I'd been selling amphetamine to colleagues. There was allegations I'd stolen money from patients to take other patients, and they, the words that people were using was patients, and to take other patients to a music festival, which I thought was an ingenious and interesting <laughs> bullshit to make up. Um, I was taken on a disciplinary for two years for which there was a full outcome, and when I went back to read the disciplinary stuff because I hadn't had any of the records, there was no complaint against me. A psychiatrist in Adelaide who runs a psychiatric unit rather worryingly and has a lot of power and control wrote to all the psychiatrists in South Australia to say I was a risk to the public. It's challenging to stand up and do this work. And if we move together, rather than ask people to sit on their own with this stuff, then some of those challenges won't be as thick and fast. When I left the system because of these complaints in 2018, they hired a private investigator to investigate me. Amazing. Do you know what the allegation was? The allegation was that I'd been raising money for charity without a charity licence, which turns out wasn't true. But the best bit was the CEO had signed off on the allegation that I had had interactions with a puppet. <laughs> anyway, I'm gone off subject. But my point is, my point is, in the face of people doing things that are perceived radical, others feel vulnerable. And that's a legitimate vulnerability. It's absolutely. The story of vulnerability in the face of difference is not that different to the story of the person who's come to us with difference. So our job is not to say, oh, that guy's too radical, I'm going to try and bring him down. But actually, it's a responsibility of all the people in that space to come together and acknowledge those vulnerabilities. You know, when I was reading about the history of, this, of East Perth this morning and the first colonisers that came here, the invasion that came here, it was easy for me as a white British person to not want to read that. Because that's my culture that's done that. But actually, it's also my responsibility not to run away from it. Because I need to stop doing it if I'm still doing it. You know, and in that, there's the healing, I believe. Anyway. So just to clarify what radical is, and this is the best bit, it's of or having roots, and it meaning of going to the origin, and it's essential. And I really like etymology, because we can play with words and take words that people use as slurs and difficulties, and we can turn them into good things. So all I'm suggesting in my work is that we are all radical, because we all return to the origins of the social stories that people are presenting. And in doing that, we'll find new meaning. Just a couple of examples of what's going on there. This is the work of Lucy Johnson, Dr. Lucy Johnson, and a working group in England from the Power Threat Meaning Framework. This is an example of how we're shifting from the old narratives of diagnostic labels towards social constructs. Um, and and the, the, the Power Threat Meaning Framework is concerned with narratives and formulations. Things like patterns can be used as a guide in assisting people to contextualise. Well, that, that's something we'd all want to do. It doesn't matter whether you're a peer worker, a psychiatrist, or any other discipline, family member, a loved one, or a lived experience. We all want to try and contextualise what's going on. Um, what we refer to as narrative approaches for understanding our world are common in traditional cultures. Um, so actually, without taking away from first cultures, what can we learn that we've lost in the development of other cultures is important. In the context of services and clinical teams, the term formulation may be used to refer to the same process. So we can use the language we've got of formulation to understand and frame the narratives of people towards deeper understanding. It's beautiful stuff. And it's not limited to verbal accounts, which really gives us a permission that people are allowed to come and express themselves just how they want. 
Our job is to get out of the way and, and understand what the expression means. And that's a skill that any health profession would, would want to embrace. So what I'm saying shouldn't be too radical. And then just to summarise, this approach supports people to move from pathologising and problem-saturated stories of self to richer and more empowering narratives about personal identity. So these models might look radical and different, but actually they're quite straightforward. There's some core questions in the, in the Power Threat Meaning Framework, and the principle of it is how has power operated in your life? So what's been the negative operation of power? How did it affect you? you know, how did you notice that that changed things in your life? What sense did people make of it? How has the experience you had of misuse of power left with meaning in your life? That's a really important question. And what did you do to survive? Because that's the threat response or the coping strategies we talk about in trauma. Your survival strategies are what we have labelled as coping strategies or we used to label as maladaptive coping strategies. Not maladaptive to survive. That's a survival instinct. So just moving back to psychosis, one of the points I want to make about psychosis, and I'm running out of time to tell you my new word, um, this paper coming out is all concerned with the idea that what we actually need to do when we have a psychotic person in front of us is the responsibility of the other to, to think about creating environmental conditions where the person who's said to be psychotic no longer needs to be psychotic. If psychosis is a response to trauma and adversity and the threat in relationship is thus that someone's psychotic, it's my job to notice what I'm doing. It's not the job of the person who's in distress and vulnerable because that's re-traumatising. So, so that's an important thing. And when we do that, we come into a loving and safe relationship and people can move from liminality into main. And, and so when you, when you, when you get labelled as psychiatric, particularly language like psychotic and psychosis uh, and schizophrenia, you become liminal to the rest of society. And this, pro this approach is about inviting people back into the fold. Um, I was hesitant to say this on camera, but I've been hearing a voice for the last six months that I haven't, I haven't heard voices in 19 years or something. You know, but none of you are going to turn around and ask me to sit somewhere else and be different to the rest of you. So, so we don't need to do that. So, dissociocotic, what is it? The experience of animation and giving life to being at variance of companionship to self, lots of language, essentially active to get away from ourselves, uh, in order for survival of self, for my survival, when somebody else is creating a threat to me. So that's all it is. Why is it important? Well, I was thinking about psychosis and thinking, if psychosis isn't biogenetic and it's not a disease label, then what is it? Well, we know that people who are said to be psychotic in systems are often carrying massive stories of adversity that have come threat from human beings. Well, maybe psychosis is just a representation of trying to get that human being away. So that's what it is, and now I'll explain it a bit further. The difficulty with it is perception. If you can all look at the pictures, you'll see the vase. You can either see a white one, which is the vase, or the face is the black one, white one, black one. Try and look at them both together. You can't. Um, it'll switch between one and the other. And that is, in Rubin's PhD, this told us that because the outline of something is so similar, you can't hold the two pictures together. So the common human brain can't do it, right? So it's, it's, it's okay. So what I'm suggesting is the reason why we see psychosis as different is because we've been told that it's a different picture. And now we're saying it's about trauma and we're going, yeah, it's about trauma, except here you've got this schizophrenic person who might get better and then there's this kind of spectrum, and some of you, most of you will know this, you've got these treatment-resistant schizophrenics over here, right? That's the language we use. So we, the problem is then, though, is that we've got this narrative. So we say, yeah, yeah, there's trauma, and then there's the really schizophrenic person. So then we can't kind of hold these two frames together. So dissociocotic comes from that. And just to run you through it, the old story is we had a, a reptilian brain. We acted on fight, flight, freeze, adrenaline, basic needs. There was an animal. It was bigger than us. We would needed to kill it to eat it, um, but it was bigger than us. So the fight response of that experience didn't work. We'd run away from it. That didn't work because it had a response to need to chase us down and kill us for its food as well. So everyone's acting. <laughs> So the animal chases after us, but unfortunately it's quicker than us and it's bigger than us and it's got its primal needs. So we used to lie flat and freeze and then go into dissociation. If you've ever seen a video of an animal and a person who's playing dead to survive it, their whole body limps out. It's quite fascinating. Wonderful human brain. And what happens? Well, the animal runs past us, and there's a little bit of poetic license in that, but the animal needs to chase down its prey. It doesn't want to get a static thing. So that used to work, right? And that's what we now recognise as dissociation. If you've ever worked with a person who's identified as having dissociation, you'll see the shutdown, the blunting, the, the beyond fight, flight, freeze experience. Then our brain evolved, and there's a bit of theory behind it, but I haven't got time. Um, and the new threat was now from humans. 
It's no longer from animals. And at the same time, our brain evolved from the reptilian brain to having the mammalian brain. That cognitive processing center, the ability to be much more skillful in its um, definition of what the threat was and how it needs to respond. So if the threat is from me as a therapist or a person in our society and I try and fight it, if I look at all mad in any way, fighting therapist doesn't work and you get detained. And if you don't get detained, you get arrested or both. If you try and run away, um, that doesn't work anymore because despite having a mental health act that is democratic under the legislation of each state, we've all agreed now that if someone's detained in one state, we'll treat them in the other state. You know? But we've gone to that point. So running away doesn't work. Lying flat. What happens if we lie flat and another human being's there and we dissociate? Does the person run past us? No, because we're caring beings. The person in the chair has a cognitive processing centre and wants to revive the person who's mad or uh, who's dissociated. So we go and do weird things to them. So it used to work, right? It used to, these are my drawings, by the way. It used to work that laying flat, the threat would disappear. But that doesn't work anymore. And now we've got this incredible brain, so we've created a new response which is to have voices, visions, and madness. And it's a terrible tragedy, but the truth is, is if you stand outside of the front of the Hyatt today and someone's screaming at their voices, you'll all move away from them. So the process is the same in psychosis as it, is, as it was when there was an animal and a human in the flattening out of dissociation. So dissociocotic is explaining that it's as simple as noticing that in this moment, I created enough threat by my being in relationship to another person who's probably had trauma and adversity and is hypervigilant to this, and therefore, it's my responsibility to notice what I did. Was it the change in my tone of voice? Was it that I was using my hands? Was it that as they cried, I moved closer to them? I won't go through this, but essentially what we're saying is we need to facilitate whatever was safe before to reoccur, and then we need to invite the person to tell us what it was that I did, or I need to notice what I did, and attune to the needs in safe relationship of that person. And in that space, psychosis doesn't exist. So we can use new language, we can use social codes, and we can all move together as human beings in human relationship, and we can change the way we do mental health if we want, and I think that's what these conferences are about. What does that look like? This is taken from emotional CPR. When we're talking about labels and we're seeing people as different to us and we're putting people in deterministic boxes, we're trapped in a trauma model of. The person who's experienced trauma is in trauma, the person who doesn't really know what to do and dehumanises someone, they're in trauma as well. We've got this thinking process that doesn't work. When we allow ourselves to come into sharing of psycho-environmental dilemmas and trauma that we're all vulnerable in, we bring our hearts to the work. We bring love to the work, we bring connection and human relationship to the work. And that's the place of healing. It leads in this model to connection, empowerment and revitalization. It can lead to what you want, but it's the way forward in social understanding of human distress. These were just two things of uh, when we rolled this out in the system in South Australia. Um, the feedback we got from staff, which I thought was really interesting. Someone said it's like applied recovery. Just a word, we need to be careful of that. That we're <laughs> Recovery's always been recovery. <laughs> it's just the professionals that we surveyed that have got on board now. And this was just by introducing them to an approach they could use. But recovery was there. And it was the uh, same principle with trauma-informed care. And what I'm suggesting is, is that when we use these social approaches and when we understand people's human distress as, an, as a meaningful response to adversity and trauma, a sane response to insane circumstance, when we get into those relationships, there's suddenly a flow of new life in our communities and psychosis doesn't exist. Thank you very much.